He has served four parishes and three mission churches in the metropolis of San Francisco. In addition to his priestly ministry, he is a licensed marriage and family therapist and a certified clinical trauma professional. He held a private practice as a therapist for six years in Oregon, while also teaching as an adjunct, adjunct professor at George Fox University's graduate program of counseling, teaching courses in the spirituality and clinical praxis, as well as interpersonal neurobiology and trauma. Father Timothy has spoken around the country in Orthodox churches of all jurisdictions on marriage, parenting, addictions, Orthodox spiritual life, and stress and resiliency. Father Timothy holds a bachelor's in psychology, a master's in divinity, a master's in pastoral counseling, and a certificate in marriage and family therapy. He and his wife, Presidetta Victoria, have been married since 1995 and have nine children between the ages of eight and 25 and one grandchild. His topic for this evening is lessening our stress with nurturing, while nurturing our resilience. Something I think we all uh, would love to get a better handle on. So without further ado, welcome Father Timothy. Thanks, Father Peter. Thanks for the introduction. Uh, and Father Michael, thank you for hosting this. This is a brilliant idea. Um, Father Michael and I were talking earlier about uh, some of the silver linings in COVID and uh, the ways that uh, our metropolis, the archdiocese, uh, certain parishes, people are uh, reaching out and doing these uh, conferences, these Zoom meetings, these presentations. I think it's, it's really wonderful. And um, I, I think something like this is probably going to continue even outside of COVID uh, because it, I think it's really helpful and meaningful. So thank you both uh, for putting this all together. Um, I listened to the other talks, uh, George Papa George, one of my favorite people in the world. I've known George for a long time. He was on the family wellness team uh, back when we started it in 2015. Now he's the director. In fact, uh, the Family Wellness Ministry is starting a new series, a three-part series. We just finished the Eight Dates series uh, a couple of weeks ago, but um, they're starting a three-part series, and tonight's the first night. And so um, I'm not going to be on that one, obviously, because I'm with you, and I'm happy to do that. And, and those, uh, that three-part series is uh, titled Coming Home to a Better Marriage. And there's going to be three talks, and they're uh, spread apart by one month. So tonight's the first one. So hopefully you'll be able to jump on a couple of those uh, in the months to come. So anyway, um, you know, this, this talk here is something I, I, I just recently put together. I, I've talked on this topic before uh, at different times and places, but I, I think when you do this sort of work, you always look, you're always looking for ways to refine and, uh, you know, fine tune what you're presenting and so forth. And there's new information that comes up uh, as well. So I'm gonna walk you through uh, a slide presentation. And to be honest with you, I have no idea how long it's going to take because it's the first time I'm doing this particular presentation. But I'm not one to, to spend a lot of time on slides. I really am much more interested in having a dialogue with you and to uh, just discuss some of these things. So um, take some notes, um, see what may jump out at you as we go through this. Uh, there's a couple of places where I'm going to ask you to, uh, to be a little more interactive. Um, you know, some of the information, I, I tried to keep the, uh, some of the scientific stuff to a, a bare minimum. I didn't want to bore you with terminology about, you know, brain parts and neurobiology and things like that. Um, but I, I did want to put stuff in there just enough, I think, to hopefully make it meaningful and understandable. So when we look at this, um, you know, the idea uh, of lessening our stress, of course, is something that we all would want to do, right? I mean, and, and I'll, I'll have to, my disclaimer is there's no magic pill. I, I don't have the, the, the one phrase uh, to give to you to make your stress less or to make it go away, but we, we can lessen our stress. And, and the, the good news is it's, it's really all within our power, so to speak. And, um, and one of the ways we do that is by nurturing resilience. But they're really two different 
two separate things, and I'm going to present them that way. And I found this beautiful quote uh, from the Gospel of St. John. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. And that's one of my favorite passages in scripture. When, when Christ says, you know, the peace that I give you is not the peace that the world gives you. And, and I've always understood that to mean that, um, you know, I can have a, a tremendous sense of peace if I'm sitting on a beach and I'm watching the ocean or the waves lap up on the beach, or I'm sitting and watching a sunset, or there's just a lot of quiet. I, I can feel a tremendous amount of peace. Um, and, and to me, I distinguish peace like that is different from the peace that Christ gives. The, pre, the peace that our Lord can give us is the peace that the saints and the martyrs experienced when they were in the middle of a, a Colosseum about ready to be run through with swords or torn apart by animals. They had tremendous peace. And that was the peace from above. That was the pre peace that Christ gave. And, uh, and so it's different. And when we, when we begin to experience that peace, um, and in this life, I think it's, it's the, the peace from above, that, that peace that Christ gives, we, we experience it, we have it in very small doses, um, and, and maybe too infrequently for us. But it's so beautiful, because after he says that, he says, let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Why would we be troubled? Why would we, we be afraid of anything? If we have that peace from Christ, we would never fear we would never be troubled. And so um, that is what we uh, long for. And in the next life, we have it in its, in its fullness. But now uh, we have to just um, take the crumbs from the master's table, so to speak. All right. So these are some of the objectives. This is just the, the teacher and me coming out. <laughs> it's not quite as bad as a syllabus, but um, what I'd like to try to accomplish this evening with you is uh, to define stress and resiliency, uh, just simple definitions. There are many definitions that are out there. Learn also how and why we experience stress. Learn about the impact of stress, both on our brains and also on our bodies. Uh, learn how to decrease the experience of stress in our lives. And if you notice the wording there, uh, learn how to decrease the experience of it not uh, have stress out of our life, not to dec decrease stress, but decrease the experience that we have of it. And then I just wanna revisit sort of a, a scriptural perspective on stress, uh, worry, and anxiety, just as a reminder. So what is stress? Um, let me see here, I gotta get rid of this, okay. There's a couple things. One is that uh, it's, it's a mental or emotional state, right? So when we feel stress, we can talk about it in terms of a mental or emotional experience, a strain or tension. And we can usually point to uh, something outside of us, something adverse or some, something that's sort of uh, demanding on our life or our time or something like that. Um, there's also a physiological response or part of this. These are disturbances or damage that's caused to, a, to an organism, us, or it could be an animal uh, by the adverse circumstances. So this is what stress is. So, so keep in the back of your mind that from these two definitions, um, we're told that strain, tension, disturbance, or damage to our mental, emotional, physical well-being is due to some sort of adverse or demanding circumstance. So what's being said here is that there is something externally responsible for our experience of stress. Okay, so keep that in mind. So what is resiliency? This is one definition. The ability to face challenges, manage those challenges, recover from them, and to be strengthened and grow from them, all right? So when you think of someone who has resiliency, um, we, we think of someone who can endure and move through situations and not become completely undone by them. Uh, another thing about resiliency is it's something that we're all born with. It's a capacity that we have and we all have a different capacity. We're all able to grow in that capacity, which is really important to know. 
so we can become more resilient. And the beautiful thing is that we can actually be a part of other people's growth. We can help others. Um, when, when we look at this in terms of being born with a capacity, while uh, genetics play a role in one's inherent ability to be resilient, uh, really the most significant determinant of resilience, and this is noted in nearly every review or, or study of resilience in the, in the last 50 years, is the quality of our close personal relationships especially with parents and primary caregivers. That is, that is the one thing that comes up time and time again is the quality of our close personal relationships. Um, and one of the top traumatologists in the world, Bessel uh, van der Kolk, um, who wrote a, a brilliant book, if you haven't read it and you're interested in this topic on trauma and the body, it's called The Body Keeps the Score. But he said, how loved you felt as a child is a great predictor of how you manage all kinds of difficult situations later in life. And that's pretty interesting. That's pretty fascinating. Um, just as a footnote, um, uh, Gabor Matei, he's a, a, a medical doctor out of New York, uh, who's an expert in uh, addictions and uh, addiction recovery and so forth. But he said something that was, was equally powerful. And he said that in all, addict, in all addicts, we can trace back the origins of this behavior to relationships in life. So you, you'll hear, hear me talk a lot about relationships and about God being a relational God and that we're created in his image as relational beings. I cannot tell you how important it is for us to understand that in terms of our resiliency, uh, just in terms of our life, our spiritual life, everything, almost every aspect of it. So let's move on to the next objectives. So why and how do we experience stress? So I'd like for you uh, to take a minute and, and chime in. Uh, and maybe you can answer this or give me some of your own answers. You'll have to uh, unmute yourself. But name some things that cause stress, cause you stress. What are some things that cause you stress? Deadlines. Deadlines. Okay, good. Another one. How about your children? Yep, absolutely. I know, I know mine do. <laughs> Money. Money, finances. Yep. Anyone else? Work, yeah. So let's take a look at some of that. Look, work was the first one. Finances, that was mentioned. Uh, children was mentioned. Um, relationships, aging, politics, demands. Uh, I think like work deadlines was mentioned. So these are things that we say cause us stress and we can probably add to this list, right? All right. So what are some of the effects of stress? In other words, when we feel stressed, what, what are some of the things that can happen to a person when they're under a lot of stress? They can develop health issues. Absolutely. They can develop all sorts of health issues. What else? Irritable. Irritable, right? Good. You get tense. Mm -hmm. Perfect. You may lash out at people. Yes, right. Emotionally unstable. Yes, perfect, yeah. You be, we can become emotionally uh, compromised. Well, let's look at some of that because those are on some of these two. We can experience anxiety, depression, uh, irritability was mentioned, fatigue, sleep problems, under or overeating, isolation, uh, somatization, meaning, you know, those are the tensions that you mentioned in terms of muscle tension or uh, somatic uh, problems, health issues, okay? So we looked at uh, the cause, right? We, we mentioned some causes and those were the causes we mentioned. 
And we said, because of things like work finances, health concerns, relationship, aging, children, politics, and demands, we will begin to experience anxiety, depression, irritability, and these other things. So this is, is, this is uh, what we, we refer to as linear causality, right? These things on the left cause the effects that we experience on the right. Uh, so I'm depressed. I can't sleep. I'm really anxious. And if I ask you why, you would say, well, we're having financial problems. Uh, my in-laws, my children or something. So what if I were to tell you that these causes and others that you mentioned are not the reason for your stress? They are not the reason for your stress. And as long as you believe that they are the causes of your stress, there's a good chance you'll keep experiencing some of the undesirable effects you see on the right. So now I'm, I'm challenging the linear uh, causality, A causes B, okay? And this is what I'm going to prove to you tonight. All right, so what causes stress? <laughs> As the one fish psychiatrist says to the fish that's a client, and what would you say is the source of your stress? And the answer to this, okay, is perceived threat. Stress equals perceived threat. Stress is, stress is nothing more than a reaction to a perceived threat. And it is really the single cause of all stress. We experience stress when we encounter financial or relational difficulties at work, in the home, in traffic, because we've learned through painful past experiences to perceive threat in these circumstances, okay? Are you still with me? All right, this is important because there's a difference between a perceived threat and a real threat. And oftentimes we act as if there's a real threat when there isn't, it's just a perception of one. Now, in this instance, if you look at that little cartoon, the fish that's laying down with big eyes open perceives a threat. And you can see that he or she is not doing well. Now, the, the, the fish psychiatrist there could ask, have you ever been attacked by a cat before? Or has a cat ever stuck their face or paw in here? And he would say, no but the thought of it happening is what is stressing me out. Perceived versus real threat. All right, I want you to take a look at this picture. Um, I'm gonna give you a little setting and this is your setting, okay? This is you. It's about 11.15 at night and you just had dinner with some friends and you're walking back to your car that's in this parking lot. And uh, I want you to sit with this picture for a minute and just sort of let yourself feel what you might be feeling in this moment. So where we're looking at, where you're looking at this picture, I want you to be standing right there in that, uh, in that garage underneath that, that floor and so forth. And I want you just to sit with this for a second. I want you to think, put yourself in this place. Uh, I, I need to walk down and to the right a few spots to find my car and it's late at night. So just sit with that and put yourself in that, in that place right now uh, for just a few seconds. All right, what comes up? What comes up in, in a feeling sense? Panic. Okay, you start to feel a little panicky watchful okay so you're a little more vigilant than you would normally be it's what's that i was going to say vigilant also uh -huh. yep okay. i'd be putting my keys between my fingers uh-huh and so 
why, why is that response happening? You can't see very well in the dark, so you're surrounded by unknowns. Okay. And what, what is it that we're thinking may happen and which is creating a high alert within us? Somebody's going to whip out from behind one of those columns with a loaded weapon and say, give me all your money. Right. Now, that is our perception, right? It's not, we're not saying it, it can't happen. It, it could happen. And when I was in my training um, to become a certified trauma professional, the, uh, the instructor, we had about 100 people there. And he said, um, he talked about, you know, uh, he goes, how many of you here would be, uh, ha have a sense of fear um, having to walk in a, uh, a, a dark parking garage late at night uh, that was, you know, fairly empty to go get to your car. How many of you would feel fear? And almost every single person raised their hand. He says, so you're perceiving that there's a threat there. And they all nodded yes. And he said, um, now, how many of you have actually been attacked in a parking garage? And not one person raised their hand, not one person out of that hundred had ever been attacked. So he said, so it's not a real threat. It's, it's a perceived threat. It's what, you're, it's what you're thinking could happen. It must be already started. Okay. So this perceived threat, right, leads to what we call a stress response. Have you guys ever seen the movie Inside Out? Great movie great, great movie. Um, when we have fear, a perceived threat, eventually it's going to lead us to either we could become sad, we could become enraged, um, we could shut down. Stress is an automatic response to a perceived danger that exists entirely within our bodies and our minds. And once we learn how to control this response, this stress response, we can greatly reduce stress in our life, okay? And this is on all sorts of levels, in, in, in relationships, uh, in driving, in flying, in whatever you wanna apply it to. When we perceive a threat, like um, I, uh, I have someone um, who I know well, who has a great fear a great fear of flying. And I asked, I said, have you ever been in a plane crash? And he said, no. And I said, what are you afraid of? Well, it, it could go down. I mean, it could happen. I'm like, yeah, it could. And they were already in a stressed response, just thinking about it. We weren't even in an airport. Okay. Um, but it was, it was the idea that was in their mind. And then thinking about the perception of something actually happening, the body went into a stress response, all right? The other thing we mentioned is painful past experiences. Um, and there, there are really a couple main ones. One is early childhood events or relation, uh, and or relational experiences. We call these ACEs or adverse childhood experiences. Um, or if it's later in life, we could look at recent events and or relational experiences within an adult life. So. Painful past experiences play a major role in our stress response. Uh, PPEs are embedded in our body. Painful past experiences are embedded in our body. Uh, even when we may not be able to consciously recall a painful past experience, okay? And that typically happens due to what we call dissociation. Trauma or painful past experiences can cause our memory processing system to malfunction. And so our explicit memory system fails, which doesn't allow the traumatic memory to be logged or stored properly. So you know the difference between implicit and explicit memory. Explicit memory is, 
oh, I remember that this morning I had um, toast for breakfast. Or I remember two weeks ago, I went and visited my friend up in Chicago. An implicit memory is one that I can't recall like that. But the memory of whatever the experience was is still there. And it still can cause a stress response in me, even though I'm not consciously aware of whatever that experience was. It's buried in my implicit memory. All experiences are stored, every one of them, whether we can remember them or not. And oftentimes in doing trauma work, we listen to the body in order to find, find where sort of the stressors are in this person and, and to find those experiences as well, if they can be found. And they don't need to be found always. But the body, as Bessel van der Kook says, keeps the score. So there's a lot of information stored up in us. Um, when we experience a traumatic event, uh, our brain subverts to a, a simpler method of recording signals and encoding traumatic memories as pictures or uh, body sensations. And as I said, this is called dissociation, where memories are split really into fragments and they remain embedded in the mind like shrapnel, uh, impeding the brain's natural recovery process. So uh, people say, ah, I don't know, I just have a really, really, really sick feeling about this. or I'm really, really, really concerned and scared right now. And I, I just don't know what it is. I can't put my finger on it. Well, something has happened that has triggered the stress response. It could be a sight, it could be a sound, it could be a smell, it could be a number of things that would trigger that implicit memory and uh, of whatever that uh, trauma was. Now, when we look at the first one, adverse childhood experiences, these are early childhood events, we look at um, three types of ACEs. So we have uh, abuse, it could be physical, emotional, or sexual abuse, neglect, physical or emotional, or household dysfunction, like mental illness, uh, the mother was treated violently by the fathers, divorce, incarceration, uh, substance abuse, those sort of things. These are ACEs, these are adverse childhood experiences, and we all have some. Some of us may have one, some of us may have four or five. Um, and so when we talk about early childhood experiences, we look at uh, these ACEs, which often lead to chronic mental and physiological problems, anywhere from just having headaches, uh, upset stomach, muscle tension, fatigue, um, these sort of things. Um, if you want, if you really want to learn more about this particular uh, part, uh, this ACEs, um, I'd really suggest you watch a TED Talk by uh, a lady by the name of Nadine Burke Harris. Nadine Burke Harris. She's in San Francisco. She's a brilliant uh, medical doctor. Um, and she gives a, an, an amazing TED talk on ACEs. And, you know, TED talks are 20 minutes, so it's really concise, but she's given many other talks. This has taken the, the, the pediatric world by, world by storm. Um, and it also has helped us to understand a lot what's going on with adults with these sort of chronic problems that we have. Um, so there are these mechanisms by which um, ACEs influence health. And you can see at the bottom here, um, there are the adverse childhood experiences, which we covered the different types. This can lead to uh, disrupted neural development in the brain, um, can also lead to social, emotional, and cognitive impairment, right? Um, and I would say relational as well. Uh, adoption of high-risk behaviors uh, is something else that happens. Um, this could be like drinking, smoking, things like that, disease, disability, and social problems, and even early death. So ACEs are very, very profound, and there are hundreds and hundreds of studies out there, but all of this is related to stress as well, and of which there are different types. So let's look at some of those real quick. Um, we have acute stress, episodic, chronic, and post-traumatic, okay? And uh, we're, let's look at these one at a time. So the first one, acute stress, it's usually brief, but it's the most common. It's what we would experience mostly uh, throughout our life, often caused by reactive thinking. Negative thoughts persist about a situation that have recently occurred or upcoming situations. Um, we spend a lot of time uh, thinking about these things and we are in a stress response because of how we're thinking about them that affects us emotionally, physically, 
And also we have this hyperarousal, which I'll get into later, but that's elevated blood pressure, rapid heart rate, and so forth. But even acute stress can lead us to being irritable and angry and tense and have physiological problems and all those sorts of things. The next one is episodic acute stress. Um, this is a frequent occurrence of acute stress. So the, the, it's, we talk about, when we talk about the sort of symptoms, we talk about intensity, duration, uh, and frequency, okay? And so with episodic acute stress, the frequency has increased. And people here are, are just often anxious and, and, and irritable, short-tempered. They seem to always be in a rush, um, kind of chaotic. They are in a episodic acute state of stress. Um, and again, there are some examples, emotional distress, what it looks like, uh, cognitively, it can compromise our ability to be attentive, to concentrate, to process, thereby to learn. And interpersonally, it would make sense that we would have a difficult in, in our relationships as well. And some of the other physiological effects, chronic stress is most harmful. Um, and it's really what we would call uh, a chronic sympathetic nervous system activation. And I'll talk about the, this, the uh, sympathetic nervous system in a little bit, but it's in, a, it's in a constant state of physiological arousal. Now we see this uh, oftentimes in, in trauma, especially with children, um, but we can also see it in abuse uh, cases, um, uh, abuse with, with, uh, among spouses. We can see it in, uh, in incarcerated people or in people that are in, uh, who are taken prisoners in camps and things like that. And if that's left untreated, then it can cause irreversible damage to us physically and also mentally. So when we look at the effects of stress on the brain, this is the next one of the other objectives. The, this is a PET scan that shows a healthy brain on the left where the color red indicates healthy activity in major regions of the brain, okay? On the left is a brain of a Romanian orphan who was institutionalized shortly after birth and shows the effects of extreme deprivation. As an orphan, there was very, very little connection, attention, comfort, uh, loving, those sort of things. And that was an experience for this child of chronic stress because an infant needs those things, right? In order to develop um, their brain to develop normally. Uh, so the lack of the development in the brain are the regions uh, that you see here are um, in these circles, okay? So, um, and these, and if you look at the brain, the, the, this is the frontal lobe here, you have the parietal lobe, and then you have the occipital lobe back here. So I, I, this is where I don't want to get too techy on you and so forth, but I think it's just worth pointing out that the, the frontal lobe and, and this is really the neocortex. We're looking at it from a top down, but if you looked at it from a front on, uh, the, the frontal lobe, uh, this area here, is really responsible for reasoning, uh, motor control, logic, uh, emotion and language and so forth. And you can see how underdeveloped it is because the red is healthy development. And you can see how grossly underdeveloped that is, all right? The parietal lobe or, or the, the middle part, part here involves processing information from the body's senses, such as touch and temperature and pain and so forth. And there too, you can see a, 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 almost a complete absence, right, of a healthy brain. Um, now the temporal lobe, which you see here, that, that actually is, uh, would be situated underneath the parietal lobe uh, and above the brainstem. But it, when it's underdeveloped or damaged, it could lead to difficulty in understanding spoken words, uh, difficulty in identification and categorization of objects, um, difficult learning and retaining information, uh, impairment with long-term memory, all, all sorts of things. And then finally in the back, the occipital lobe, it's really interesting here, but you can see some pretty normal development, but the occipital lobe contains really the primary visual cortex, which is responsible for interpreting incoming uh, visual information. So that doesn't seem to be as impaired. But when you think of all these other parts of the brain, a child, an orphan child who was not receiving the relational connection with the primary caregiver, you can see what happens with the development. 
And Johns Hopkins University had actually done a study on a child that had experienced chronic stress. And um, they measured the brain and the brain was significantly just smaller in size than a normal brain for a child the same age. So we can see what the effects are on brain development. The effects of stress on the body, I mean, you can just kind of look through this and see. Um, I think some of them we would understand, insomnia, depression, fatigue. Um, some of the other things we may not think about are like asthma, autoimmune disease, increased risk of stroke, uh, weakened immune system, uh, hormonal imbalances. You know, stress, they say, is the silent killer. And it really, really is. So uh, it has a tremendous effect on us physically, emotionally, psychologically, mentally, relationally, even spiritually. So the question is, how do we lessen our experience of stress in our life? And, and I, want, I want you to remember what was said earlier, that stress is a response to a perceived threat, which activates our sympathetic nervous system. So um, before we go on, uh, I, I just want to say a couple of words about this, uh, about the nervous system, again, because I think it's just helpful. So we have what's called an autonomic nervous system, right, ANS, and it's broken down, and this is simplified into two parts. We have the sympathetic nervous system and the parasympathetic nervous system. And really to understand the sympathetic nervous system, we could think of it as the gas pedal on a car, right? So we punch the gas pedal and gas rushes through the engine and explodes and and brings uh, energy and, and speed to the car and it gets everything fired up and going. That's what our uh, sympathetic nervous system does, okay? When we think of the parasympathetic nervous system, we think about putting on the brakes of the car, all right? So when the sympathetic nervous system is activated, we go into what's called a fight or flight or freeze mode, okay? And this is phenomenal stuff when I work with couples, it's really amazing. Um, they would never think that they're in a fight or flight when they're in an argument and their blood pressure is rising, but they are. And you know what fight or flight is about, right? It's about survival. Fight or flight is something that we share with the animal kingdom. And the only reason we have it is to protect us from death. So when I tell a couple that they, uh, they have a stress response, their sympathetic nervous system has been activated, their blood pressure, their heart rate, their adrenaline, we have the increase of all these things. Um, the body is ready for action. And you're in this fight or flight, which really comes out in, in couples where they fight and they argue, or they retreat and walk away, right? They flight uh, or they freeze. But the bottom line is that they're trying to survive. They're trying to survive. This is a threat of life. And they would never think of it that way, but that's what their, that's how their body is responding and acting. Fascinating. Seems a little extreme, but um, so the autonomic nervous system, these are the two parts. So when the sympathetic nervous system is activated, the fight or flight response, the heart rate increases, pupils dilate, blood is directly towards extremities, uh, senses heighten, focus narrows, digestion temporarily shuts down. Why? We don't need it. We're trying to save our life. And cortisol, right? The stress hormone in the brain is released and we are ready to either fight or run away. Okay. So that's a stress response. And, and that's, that's really important because if we're walking in the woods and a bear comes across our path, we want that bad boy activated, right? We need help. <laughs> we, we don't want to just, you know, rely on our own. We need some uh, extra energy at that time. Um, the parasympathetic nervous system, after the stressful event disappears, all highly activated body systems are allowed to slow down again. The heart rate and breathing rate decrease. Pulpits, uh, pupils constrict, digestion and saliva production increases, and calmness and broader focus set in. Okay. So, what's interesting about this is that in a stress response, we know that whatever it is that we are saying is the cause, when, when we go into a stress response, we now know that the sympathetic nervous system of our body is activated, and we are now in a fight or flight. And because we're in a fight or flight, our muscles tense up and all other sorts of things start happening internally, internally with our body. 
because we have to protect ourselves, okay? And in that state, if it's, if it's not a real threat, if it's something that doesn't, doesn't um, require us to save our life, then why don't we just address whatever it is in a non-stressed way? Why do we allow ourselves to get into this fight or flight where we know that the moment we get into a sympathetic nervous system activation mode, guess what shuts down? Our frontal lobe. And our frontal lobe, as we said, is what gives us the ability to think, to reason, to speak clearly, to analyze, to be objective. And if you've ever been in a real heated argument with something, somebody, have you ever noticed how you start to stumble over your words? It just kind of gibber starts coming out. Right? That's because we're in a fight or flight. So how effective are we going to be in that state? Well, we're not going to be effective in terms of uh, relating to somebody or being able to figure something out or to rationalize and analyze and come up with a, a, a plan, right? We are trying to save our life. So it's very important to know when that is happening to us. All right, let's move on. So just to sort of summarize, uh, during a fight or flight response, many physiological changes occur in our body. The reaction begins in our, what we call the amygdala, right? Which is that almond shaped, comes from the Greek word for almond, part of the brain that perceives a threat, right? And the perceived threat comes from a painful past learning experience, right? Um, and then signals the hypothalamus, which activates the, the this, this nervous system, okay? Now, what's interesting is that, um, well, let me, let me just throw this in here real quick. So simultaneously, the part of our brain, which is responsible for reasoning, logic, analyzing, this was the prefrontal cortex that I was mentioning, all of that stuff goes offline. So here's something really, really interesting. Um, that same uh, teacher that I had for um, uh, the trauma work, um, he showed us a picture of a Chinese flag and a tank in front of it. He showed us a picture of, um, I don't know, a nuclear bomb being tested uh, out in the waters somewhere, all this sort of stuff. And he, he talked about that. Uh, he, he just sort of identified what all those images were. And he says, um, he says do, do you think we live in a time where we're safer or there's more of a world threat to safety? Everybody answered, it's the world's crazy. It's going to hell in a handbasket. We, we, we're, we're in more dangerous times. We have nuts out there. I mean, people that are, and all the research shows that we are living in a time safer than any other time in the history of mankind. Now, why would we think otherwise? The news, media does a wonderful job of freaking us out, right? All we got to do is turn on the news, radio, television, watch CNN, Fox, whatever you want to do. Typically, the news, 95% of the time, is sharing information that is extremely, extremely, extremely concerning to all of us, right? Or it's presenting its content as something very concerning. So why wouldn't we have this sort of perception that we are threatened today more than ever before by world powers and world leaders that are crazy, right? So we, we, we are living in this sort of perceived threat that the world is more unsafe now when in fact it is safer than it's ever been. So Viktor Frankl, I don't know if you've ever read uh, Viktor Frankl. Uh, he was in a death camp in World War II. Uh, he wrote a beautiful book called Man's Search for Meaning. And he says in one place, between a stimulus and response, there is a space. And in that space lies our power to choose our response. And in our response lies our growth and our freedom. Now, this man survived the death camp. So I think he knows what he's talking about because he saw a lot of his comrades committing suicides, committing suicide or being shot and killed. But he was able to live through it and also live with hope and joy in the midst of it. Okay. So that's why he can say this. Very, very beautiful. 
So we fill the space, if we fill the space between the stimulus and the response with stress, and we activate that response, that stress response, what happens is that our energy level goes up, our muscles become constricted, right? That was mentioned by one of you in terms of muscle, muscle tension when we feel stress. Um, so that goes above the threshold. That's not good. Our neocortical functioning, right? That actually goes way below the threshold. That means we've compromised our ability to reason and think and even be calm. And we have compulsive actions. We become aggressive or we become avoidant, right? That's the fight or flight. That's if we fill that space between the stimulus and the response with stress and reactivity. Or we could fill that space with self-regulation and intentionality, okay? Now, if we choose to, to fill it with this, our energy level will go down because we are self-regulating. We are noticing that the heart rate, the blood pressure, pulse, all these things are starting to increase. And I notice this, but then I self-regulate and I relax and my muscles relax, the energy goes down and my neocortical functioning actually goes higher, all right? So everything is, is staying on the right, on the proper side of the threshold. And this is intentional, principle-based, and we ha can have integrity, right? This is how we want to be. So how do we do this? What does this mean? Uh, we need to learn how to relax our body. Now, this sounds very simple, and it is in theory, but it takes practice. I can tell you this, okay? Experiencing stress and having a relaxed body can't happen at the same time. You cannot have stress in a relaxed body. The two just simply can't coexist. So let me ask, when your body is completely relaxed, you just feel like a wet noodle and you feel totally, totally relaxed. Are you experiencing any stress at that moment? No, there's no, no possible way. There's no muscle tension. Now, when you're experiencing stress, do you or does your body feel relaxed? No, it, there's tension there, right? So the two cannot coexist. So a perceived threat plus a relaxed body leads to no distress in the body. And it creates optimal neocortical functioning, intelligence, curiosity, and humor, dexterity, impulse control, relational skills, et cetera. And you can be intentional about what you think, what you say and do, and not be reactive. When you respond to a perceived threat by relaxing your body, you will not experience distress. Okay? You'll also uh, not only maintain this sort of optimal, optimal functioning, but you can think and reason clearly. You can be empathic. You can understand, listen to other people with intention and with purpose in order to understand you can be fully present all right um, this little thing here is called yerkes dotson curve and it, it shows that on the uh, on the bottom axis the level of stress from low to moderate to high and then our ability to perform on the on the right hand side there and you can see that by maintaining a relaxed body you can maintain uh, your peace you can act with integrity according to uh, your moral values, uh, to what's important to you regarding character, your belief system, all of these sort of things. And so when we're low on stress, it can actually, we can actually experience some boredom, right? Um, when, when it starts to increase a little bit, we can become a little more alert, more engaged. We kind of feel comfortable here. And then as we get up the curve a little bit, right? This is where growth and learning occurs. And this is where we feel challenged. And at this point, the amount of stress we're experiencing is good, okay? Stress can be very good for us at this level right in here. But when stress goes over the curve, we, ex we begin to experience things like fatigue and exhaustion. We get into this distress zone. We can experience compassion fatigue or burnout. We can become anxious and these sort of things. So we see that there's a certain level of stress that we can be very optimal in our functioning, but then when we get over the level, over the hump here, we start to deteriorate. And that's important for us to be aware of because when, when I say I'm stressed and I'm feeling these things over here on the right, that means that my performance is going down and I'm not good for anybody. 
And believe me, I have experienced burnout and compassion fatigue. And it's something I would never wish on anybody. And it lasted probably a good six to seven months. And during that time, and that's because I wasn't taking care of myself and I wasn't learning how to, um, uh, to manage myself. And I didn't want to talk to another person. I didn't want to hear one problem from one person ever again. So it's a horrible place to be. So we have to know when we go over that curve um, so that we can do something about it that's going to be productive. So I want to, I want to do a little experiment here. Um, so take a few seconds to think and, and just sit uh, with the memory for a little bit. Um, uh, what I want you to think about is, I don't know, you, you can pick whatever it, is, every, whatever it is that you want, but really I want you to think about the last time you really felt stressed. And that could have been a half hour ago. Well, hoping not a half hour ago because we were starting this. I hope you weren't feeling stressed at that point. Um, but uh, maybe it was something earlier today. Maybe it was something yesterday, whenever it may be. But I want you to think about for a moment when you really felt stressed. Uh, close your eyes, take a deep breath, and just sort of sit with that experience. Think about what it was and how you were experiencing at that, at that moment. Okay, just wait for a few seconds here. Now, now tell me what was going on inside of you, whether your body, if it was a felt sense in your body, uh, or if it was something that you were feeling in your, uh, your sympathetic nervous system maybe being activated, but uh, tell, me, uh, tell me maybe what you were sensing or feeling at that moment for those few moments. Peace and tranquility. Okay. So as you were thinking about your most stressful moment, you were feeling peace and tranquility. Because I was consciously not there in my okay. most stressful moment. I was here. Okay. All right. So you were able to differentiate that. Was Did anybody experience stress? A stress response when they began to think about it? I did. I felt uh, my heart beat fast and... Almost like I couldn't take a deep breath. Mm, okay, very good. And definitely um, along the same lines with uh, almost like a sense of not energy, um, like you're almost like your blood pressure rising, literally yeah. like you're coming back alive. And it's like, okay, uh, kick into gear because you got to do something in order to react to what's happening. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and so who do you think is doing that? Uh, I suppose me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Are you enjoying that? <laughs> oh, I've been doing it for like how many years now? <laughs> oh, yes. Oh, we are experts. We are experts. Absolutely. We are experts. Yeah. You know, and, and it's interesting, just the thought of that. I mean, think about, I mean, how many people suffer from insomnia that's related to thoughts that are related to worries and concerns or past experiences where they're just getting all bound up and angry and whatever, you know, who's doing that? We, we do that to ourselves. Okay. So what we have, one of the things I want to, you know, just uh, introduce you to too, is, is this um, the difference between an external versus an internal locus of control. Um, External locus of control is when we attribute stress to our environment, to people and situations outside of ourself. And an internal locus of control, we take more responsibility for our responses and we choose how we will allow our environment or people or situations to affect us, how we feel and think. Um, external locus is controlled. Uh, I'm stressed because of work, finances, health issues, my in laws. And when we operate from an external locus of control, we relinquish our freedom to manage our responses. And we put our sense of peace or lack thereof in something outside of ourself. And this is a recipe for a miserable life. Um, internal locus of control 
is sometimes equated with the term self-determination or personal agency. And in family systems theory, uh, a person who functions with or from the perspective of internal locus of control would, would, be, uh, would be called someone who has a high level of differentiation. They don't allow that which is outside of them to affect how they feel emotionally or think or anything else. And typically we respond in life and live from an external locus of control place. And we blame things around us. And we thereby give sort of power to all of those people or situations and things in terms of how we feel. It's like, I, I, I mean, it, it's almost like we've just accepted that that's just the way it is. And we have no control over that whatsoever. So I want to I want to introduce you to a kind of an interesting term called interoception, not interception, like in a football game, <laughs> interoception. Um, a great deal of building up our resiliency is about developing greater self-awareness, uh, about processing information, both internal, what we're feeling physically and emotionally, and uh, external, you know, the cues that we take from people uh, around us, interoception. Um, hang in there with me, and this is kind of a wordy thing here, but interoception is the two directional communication between bodily sensations and cognitive oversight to support physical and emotional well being. Okay, it's a two way directional communication between body and brain to support physical and emotional well-being. Sensations from the body underlie most, if not all of our emotional feelings, especially those that are most intense. Okay? Sensations from the body underlie most of those feelings. In other words, we experience something physiologically even before we experience the stress. Okay, or whatever that is, that's we're, we're blaming it on. So interoceptive awareness is the ability to identify, access, understand, and respond appropriately to the patterns of our internal signals. But we have to know what those internal signals are when they're happening. And doing this provides an advantage to engage in life's challenges and ongoing adjustments while experiencing less, if any, stress. So this is all about, um, it's, it's the process of consciously shifting our attention away from the outside world, okay, to the interior world of our body, our felt sense. And this is what is meant by interoception. Um, one person called it bodyfulness. Um, this is different than mindfulness. You know, mindfulness is a really popular term. It's been around for a while now. Um, and mindfulness is really a term um, which, uh, in which we simply observe our thoughts um, without judging our thoughts or without engaging them. We're just like, hmm, that was an interesting thought. Or when we're doing this interoception, it's like, wow, that was, as soon as I saw that, my heart started to really pound. I wonder what that was about. Why, why, why did that happen? What was it? about that that caused this to happen in me. That's, that's interoception uh, kind of talk there. So our goal is to become really acutely aware of what's going on with our body, listening to what it's telling us, okay? And, and this, this I, I, I see this also in the life of, um, of Saint Seraphim of Sarov. It was really interesting. I don't know how many of you know his life, but, in this picture here, you know, he knelt on a rock for a thousand days. And I don't know if you know this, but uh, as the story goes, the reason he went out into the woods and knelt on a rock and prayed for this amount of time was because he detected a very slight movement in his heart that he judged one of his brother monks. And this was unacceptable to him. And this was his repentance. He, he, he has self-imposed this penance uh, of, of kneeling on a rock and praying for a thousand days. This is really sort of an example of a, of a spiritual interoception, an awareness of the movements in the heart. Um, it's, it's being really acutely aware or attentive to oneself, noticing what's happening with one's thoughts, one's feelings, one's sensations, 
the, the body, even movements in the heart. And this is something that I think is so, so, so important uh, to us in terms of just life and healthy living. We are, we are typically so externally focused and this is the worst thing we can do because a couple of things are gonna happen primarily. One, we're just gonna judge a lot of people, okay? Uh, or two, whatever it is that, whatever stimuli that we're taking in, we're gonna allow it to affect us and to cause that stress response. But when we're more aware of self and what's going on, then we don't know what's going on out there. We can kind of see things, but we're not as interested in them. And this is a much better place to be uh, in, in all aspects. Um, in close connection with inter interoception, we have emotional or self-regulation, okay? Uh, this involves a coherent relationship with the self, effective communication between body thoughts and feelings, it implies tolerance and understanding of signals from the body and implies having the capacity then to positively manage challenging sensations related to behavioral responses. So this is different than relaxation. Self-regulation is not relaxation. Uh, there are lots of things we can do to relax. We could have a beer and relax. We could go for a walk and relax. Regulation means um, remaining present and actively participating in the everyday demands of work and life while intentionally relaxing our body. So we can remain present and still be in a relaxed state, not in a stress response, okay? So um, the stress response system is, we're looking at here in terms of helping ourselves, interoception and emotional regulation. Being responsive to an interoceptive information allows us to be aware of an emotion cue early on and therefore allows us to process hmm that's interesting i wonder why i just felt that i wonder what that 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 sensation was interpret it it must have triggered something inside of me and i, I can't think of what it is i.e it must be an implicit memory but obviously there's something there or it really reminded me of last summer when i got in that car accident and i was really afraid and then strategize at the onset of stressful events. In other words, we're in control, okay? There's a calmness just about that process. So what does this mean or what would this look like? To begin, it would be helpful to know, I think what some of the characteristics are of a resilient person, right? And so we have to remember that between a stimulus and response, there is a space and we can fill that space with resiliency. So here are some characteristics of a resilient person. They practice gratitude, okay? There is an awareness of one's blessings in life, and they visit those in their minds frequently. If you want to, if you want to learn a beautiful, gain a beautiful perspective and understanding of gratitude from an Orthodox perspective, just read the works of St. Paisios of the Holy Mountain. He has a five-volume set amazing things about gratitude and the importance of gratitude. I don't think people realize that they don't use this enough to help themselves uh, build up resiliency. Stay focused on the here and now. Backward or forward thinking, ruminating or imagining the worst case scenarios is pointless and it only increases anxiety and stress. So stay in the present moment. The minute we start going ahead of ourselves or behind ourselves we will be in a place we don't want to be. We have to try to remain in the moment, in the here and now, which by the way, is the only place where we can experience Christ is here and now. Number three, accept what they can't change about a situation. Resilient people just accept it, right? Um, and and it, it reminded me of, uh, in the addictions work I did, I worked at a 30-day inpatient rehab in Annapolis, Maryland with uh, teenagers for about a year and taking them to AA and NA meetings and, and working with them in the, in the hospital and so forth. Of course, I got very familiar, became very familiar with the serenity prayer and it's beautiful. And the serenity prayer is God grant me this, the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things that I can and the wisdom to know the difference. So that's a beautiful prayer to have as well. They are flexible in their thinking. They're not black and white, all or nothing thinking. It's a cognitive distortion and it just causes problems. Uh, they don't dwell on the negatives, right? Um, they are A, 
uh, dedicated to a worthy cause and B, believe in something greater than themselves, okay? And believing in something greater than themselves is, is in the first step of the 12-step program, right? They came, came to believe that their power is over their addiction and only something greater than themselves can restore them to sanity. So this is God in our life. And they have a good social network. They have connection with community and people. So ways to build resiliency. One is uh, to reframe your thoughts. Um, think about how Christ viewed people in situations. Um, resilient people are able to look at negative situations realistically, okay? And in a way that doesn't center on blame or brooding over what can't be changed or whose fault it was or any of that stuff. They look for small ways to tackle a problem and make changes that will help. Um, as I said, our Lord did this all the time. He always viewed people in situations so differently than anybody else. Uh, for example, how did he view the prostitute, the tax collector, the woman that was caught in adultery, the thief? He saw them all differently than the way people saw them in society. Uh, how did he view the storm that was brewing on the sea or the multitude of the people who came and they didn't have food or the blind or the lepers or the lame? He saw all these people very, very differently. And this is what we need to do. We need to begin to refrain our thoughts. We can look at something and, and, and uh, allow our stress response to kick into gear, or we can step back and look at something very differently. Um, a, a beautiful little saying is when you change the way you look at things, the way you look at things change. That's, I, I, I wish I had time to, to share with you a story. I'm kind of keeping on the time here. We're actually, whoa, we're over time. Um, ways to build resiliency. Uh, another one is to seek support. And you have people in your life that you trust. Um, we can turn to scripture, holy writings, prayer, a spiritual father, a friend, uh, People, uh, God will use people to give us insights and to help us to see things from a dis different perspective, which is sometimes uh, all that we need. And we have to use these resources. Um, remember uh, what we said about internal locus of control. I think it's important for us to recall times in our life. We can look back and we can see where we actually did well or how we got through a very difficult situation. And we can take that example and use it to help us to get through whatever it is that we're dealing with in the moment, okay? Um, it helps us not to catastrophize situations and to feel like there's no help. So again, there's this beautiful saying by, um, I just have about four more slides here, uh, by Viktor Frankl. Most of all, I think we need to remember to allow Christ to enter this space, not only in the moment between a stimulus and a response, uh, kind of when it's happening, uh, but even more so outside of those moments, meaning we intentionally need to create space in our life, a time where we set aside to be still, uh, to be silent in our thoughts and to call upon the name of Christ. This, this will help us more than anything. This is the preparation that we do to meet those moments in time too. And one of my favorite sayings is from the book of Psalms, be still and know that I am God. So finally, just a couple slides here. Um, first Peter, humble yourselves, therefore under the God's mighty hand that he may lift you up in due time, cast all your anxiety on him. Um, we know also uh, from the book of Matthew, uh, our Lord says, take up my yoke and learn from me for I'm meek and humble of heart and you will find rest for your souls. Um, according to uh, St. Sophroni and Father Zacharias that the yoke, um, that Christ speaks about is the yoke of humility. And when we take up that virtue of humility, as we cultivate it in our life, uh, we begin to find peace and rest for our souls because humility is the way of Christ. And when we follow the way of Christ, then we have that peace, which is from above the peace that he gives, not that the world gives. Uh, St. Paul says in second Corinthians, do not surrender uh, your mind to the thoughts, take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. Uh, St. Sophroni used to say that too. He would say, don't surrender your mind to the thoughts. That's important. St. Paisius talks about that too, about thoughts flying above and letting them land in our, in our mind like a plane lands on a runway. Uh, we have a choice. We don't have to accept those things. Um, this, this is something that we were able to do. We're not powerless. 
Um, in Colossians, he says, by replacing worry with gratitude and thanksgiving, and here, here are those two things again, let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts to which you have been called in one body and be thankful. Um, Philippians, do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ. So St. Paul gives us tips on how to increase our resiliency while decreasing our experience of stress. Um, it's like the Lord said to Martha, you're troubled and so troubled and worried about so many things. But you know, there's only one thing that's really needful. And Mary has chosen that. And she's here present with me, listening to my word. She's fully present in the moment now with me while you're worried about what's about to come, the people who are going to come to dinner and getting ready and all these things, okay? So to our Lord Jesus Christ, be the glory. Amen. Thank you. Uh, that's it for the presentation. Uh, forgive me. I, I know, uh, fathers, I went a little bit over time, um, about, about 15 minutes, but if we have time and you want to have questions and so forth, I'd be happy to do that. No, no apologies necessary. That was really terrific, Father Timothy. Thank you so much. Yeah, does anybody have any questions? I just want to say thank you so much. That was so great. And I'm so glad you came back to the space between stimulus and response. I tried to write it down. And oh. I'm glad you came back to that. Mm -hmm. And that you said, let God enter that space. That, I think that was, um, I just enjoyed your presentation and so helpful. Thank you so much. Well, thank you for indulging and being the, uh, the guinea pigs <laughs> for my first run of this. But um, I, I appreciate your words and uh, thanks be to God. You, 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 were, you found something there that was helpful to you. Yeah. There was a lot. Thank you so much. Yeah, there is a lot there. A lot Something that was helpful to me was um, when you talked about the effects stress has on your body and mm -hmm. the illnesses. Wow. I thought of those illnesses. So many people in my family have those illnesses. Yeah. So um, that, that's, that's a good reason to really work on stress. So thank you. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And I, you know, I think sort of knowing some of the, the neurobiology of it and just some of those basics in terms of the autonomic nervous system and just, just sort of knowing that, I mean, it, it's so important because if I can say, oh my gosh, I'm, I'm in a stress response right now and, and I don't need to be here for whatever reason, I've been interpreting something as a threat and, and I, before I think about anything, I just want to get my body in a relaxed state. And guess what? This is why uh, people would say things like, why don't you take a break? You need a timeout or I need a timeout because I know that when I'm in a stress response, I'm not going to be optimal in anything that I'm doing. So the first thing I need to do is take a timeout and get myself um, get my parasympathetic nervous system activated. I need to put the brakes on, bring all of those levels down so I can be in a calm place so I can re-engage and be effective. And that's where it, uh, it becomes very helpful in working with couples because so much damage is done when people are in a, a stress response in a fight or flight. I mean, so much damage is done in so many ways. So if we can get couples or parents and children or whatever, just to, or employees or parishioners and priests or whatever, just to say, you know what, let's take a break. Let's each, or let me get into a very calm state. Let me just get back to a better place. I'm going to go take some time. I'm going to find that space and, and, and get back to that place where I can be that I know I'm better. And then we'll resume, we'll come back. And then we can be much more effective and we can save a lot of time and a lot of hurt in the process and save our health in the process too. Good. Anyone else, any other thoughts? 
<laughs> I just saw the, the comment from uh, Dr. Hera. Yeah, I think we all agree. Yes. Oh, I don't see any comments. I'm in a, I'm in a presenter mode. <laughs> oh, it was amazing. <laughs> yeah. If, um, yeah. Thank you so much, Father Pavlatos. It was really good. Thank you, yes. Yeah, Father, your, uh, your words, I think, deeply resonated with, with a lot of us. Mm -hmm. And uh, I feel like uh, this was um, essential COVID viewing, you know? So um, we have a yeah. recording of it. And, mm -hmm. uh, and we'll definitely, um, you know, any, any parish that wants to, wants to share it, um, more, more than welcome to, because this was really very wonderful. Yeah, yeah, please do. I could probably stop sharing here, right? Uh, yeah. Maybe get into, oh, there we go. Oh, there's everybody. <laughs> nice. I see some of my own parishioners here too. That's awesome. Hey. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Well, wonderful. Thank you. Thank if, you. Yeah. Yeah. Great. If there, if there are no other questions, then uh, I'll stop recording and. Uh,